I lost a 40 million a year company. I lost a multi deca million acquisition. I lost the ability to have freedom in my life and to go be with my daughter, all because of one FedEx package from one agency. So what do people need to know when they're putting out marketing claims to Man. stay off the FTC's radar? <sighs> Onyx and Gal, appreciate yes. you sitting down, man. All right, man. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. It was a last minute face to face, which is always my preference. Yeah. Yeah. I love this. I love this setup. It's creative and uh, gave me ideas. I love it. Good. Yeah. So uh, we are, Easy Pay Direct is sponsoring your event in two weeks yes. in Tampa. So this is timely. It's not even two weeks, believe it or not. It's like a week and a half. Oh, good God. Yeah, I know. That's I want it. nothing more than to not be on the road anymore. I can imagine. Uh, yeah. But I will be there smiling, ready to uh, help the crew with payments. I appreciate it. Yeah, which I know is a hot topic in that space. Yeah, always. Um, so you are, you've been in the marketing world for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, you've built a reputation because you're good at it. Mm -hmm. um, multi eight figure company. And you've gone through all of the perils uh, of marketing weird. online. I think I'm still going through them. Yeah, well, <laughs> Every day. we both know you are because <laughs> yeah. most recently you've had a FTC suit. Yeah. So I want to hit on that, but uh, in B FTC suits are one of these things that, you know, we're intimately tied into that because yeah. historically the first thing that happened with FTC suits was that they would suspend all assets. Mm -hmm. And part of that was they would come to the payment processor. Yeah. And we were at the center of that. Um, thanks to, and I'll go on this rant another time, but thanks to response who was a nine-figure real estate info product company, seminar company, they sued the FTC and won. And the result of that suit was that the FTC is no longer allowed to suspend all assets until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. The whole world, whole info marketing world should be thanking those guys yeah. every day. And they need, everybody needs to know that in this space. This is different than AMG Capital? Yes. 21? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Because I know AMG Capital's case was huge and... Um, really helped a lot too to kind of tame the 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 aggressiveness i would say um but this is this is cool yeah well if response is watching thank you yeah <laughs> we'll uh yeah we'll connect you later when you can thank them <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about ftc but let's start um let's start at the beginning how'd you get into marketing and uh, what was your first million like <sighs> man it, it, you know what um so growing up i uh I don't, I don't come from an entrepreneurial background. I don't, I don't, my parents aren't entrepreneurs. My dad's the exact opposite. He's a nuclear mechanical engineer. The day, the guy, so here's the funny story with him. I always said the most ironic story with my dad. And he's a very inspiring person in my life, guided a lot of my um, ambitions. So he grew up in a village with no electricity. Whoa. So he would study um, to become an engineer under uh, candles and the street lamps like outside on the streets there's like so his house had no electricity there's the irony of it when he retired he retired from the nrc which is the nuclear regulatory commission which oversees all the nuclear power plants in the country and he was the head the head head government appointed decision maker for two nuclear power plants that supplied electricity to like 10 million homes Whoa. right so i was like what a, what a cool for me it was always like his story like what he did with our family from where he started to where we ended up in the U.S. I mean, I lived a very privileged life. I don't have that, oh my God, I didn't have a meal on the table story because of him. But I also, I don't know, as a kid, I processed it as a very young kid. And so it was like a burden to me too. Because I was like, he brought our family up to a certain level. It's my job now to take it to the next level. And growing up, I was just constantly looking for something. And it was like, I didn't really like this picture I was being sold of go college, graduate, job, work, overtime, build some wealth. And my best friend, I remember having a conversation with my best friend. This is like sixth or seventh grade. And this is when I think I officially said, hey, I'm going to start deviating my path. Very young. He says to me, why do you work so hard in school? Why do you always study so hard and try to get good grades? I'm like, well, because I want to do well and I want to be the best at this. And I'm, he's like, man, all I want, I want to, I want to get a B average. I want to grow up, get an average job. I want to get the, you know, this is literally word for word what he said to me. He's like, I want to get a BMW, but not the highest level one. I'll get the lowest level one. I want to have a nice, decent house, three, four kids. That's good life. Oh. And as I'm, and as I'm talking to him, I remember as a kid, this is middle school. We're, this is seventh grade. So this is the first year of middle school. And I'm looking at him like, 
what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm getting nauseous. That, that sounds like a, that sounds like prison. That doesn't sound like a good life. And until this day, by the way, here's the irony of it. <laughs> I love this guy. He goes on to become, he's now the principal of an elementary school. Oh my God. <laughs> he was like, he was like the total cartoon in school. Like we still laugh about it. And I'm like, I am not putting my kids in public school because of you. Because if they let people like you become the principal, I don't want, but you see, <laughs> he's a completely transformed person, but he has exactly what he wanted. He has a great life. He has a nice house. He has three girls. He has a BMW, not the highest of the middle, the lowest one. Oh. And he's happy. He's very happy. So I'm like, hey, I have no judgment. Good for you. But it wasn't my path. So I looked around at a young age in my community. And I'm Indian and come, you know, background is Indian, born, brought up in America. But I looked around my community. I don't know if you've ever been to a hospital or anywhere where there are a lot of doctors that con congregate, but like about 38 to 40% of doctors are Indians. Sure, yeah. So we're, we're, that's what we do, right? Yes. <laughs> and my family has gone through uh, generations. We were, my parents' generations were engineers. And then my older cousins, they were all doctors. And right now the new trend in our family is lawyers. Yeah. But I looked around at that time in my community and I said, who's got the nicest cars, the biggest houses and gets the most respect? It was doctors. So ergo, Mm. I will be a doctor. Mm. That was my reason to become a doctor. And by the way, that's a horrible reason. So like, it's don't, the worst. It's the like, it don't become so, a doctor. So quick that. interlude. My whole family is doctors. Okay. And my yeah. father, um, uh, you know, first him and his sister were the first to go to college in their, uh, world. And when I was eight, I was sitting in his study and I grew up kind of upper middle class because mm -hmm. he was a doctor. Yeah. Right. But Michigan doctors don't make the same as like Miami doctors. Yeah. No, uh, thank you unions. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sitting on the floor in a study, remember vividly. And we're talking about what I want to be when I grow up. And I said something about wanting to make money and he goes, well, don't be a doctor if you want to <laughs> make money. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I, I've got nothing but respect for doctors, by the Maybe way, my life, my life has been saved by them many times. And I'm so glad that there are doctors. And I'm so glad I'm not one of them. Because, well, you hit it on the head though. If yeah. money is the driver, the that's the wrong reason the wrong to be reason. a doctor. Yeah. The doctors and teachers, if you have a passion for the craft, yeah. fucking pursue it. Yeah. I love that. hundred percent. Yeah. But if you want to make money, so how did you see, what was the first thing that you saw so where I, you were like, doctor's not the right path? Oh man, it was a little bit far into the whole picture. So I studied my ass off through high school. I got the best SAT scores. I started studying for the SATs in sixth grade, thanks to my dad. Good God. Six, I took my first SAT in sixth grade and then I studied it. I was in tutoring. So I used to go to tutoring at Sylvan Learning Center. Okay? This is why 38% are doctors. <laughs> Fucking Indian <laughs> culture, man. I know. Jesus. Well, my dad put me in Sylvan Learning Center. And I would sit there as a sixth grader. He insisted, he fought with them to put me in the SAT prep class. Yeah. So I'm sitting at a table with three or four other 11th graders and oh my sixth God. graders studying and I'm outscoring them by the way. Amazing. Um, and so I got, I built my resume for going to college and getting to the best school. I got into an amazing program. That's not the college I wanted to go to. The program is takes 60 people worldwide per year. Wow. You are basically the child of the president of the university. It's full scholarship. You get paid to go to school there. And within the first year, so I'm going into pre-med, freshman, college, undergrad, I'm getting recruited by Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and all of them my freshman year to come to med school. There. Damn. So it's like, it's a ticket. You're, you, you, you cannot fail the program the way it's made. You don't, you don't fail. Damn. They carry you with you. You're a part of the tide and you're going to go straight to Ivy League for med school. So I'm done. My parents don't have to pay for college. I'm set. I'm going to go I, I go through this. This this program was so intense, by the way, that you have a six week boot camp before college officially begins. And during that boot camp, you cannot leave campus. You have to be up at six in the morning. You cannot have anyone in your dorm room. Like they train you to be a college, like studious college student. So I'm like intensely in this. I'm already in. A couple weeks into my freshman year, I have to go to bio class. I wake up one morning and I just had fear sweep over me. And I just realized at that very moment, I said, uh oh, I've made the biggest mistake of my life. So this is your father's nightmare. Um, yeah, well, actually, so, so that's what I thought, right? And so I dragged my feet. Now I'm having health issues during this time too. So I actually had to leave the first semester of freshman year, leave the first semester of sophomore year. So I'm behind. I'm unhappy. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in this program where there's a lot of pressure and support, but you don't go to this program and say, guys, I'm having some second thoughts. There ain't no second thoughts. You're blessed. You're moving forward. So I told some of my close friends who are in the program too, sophomore year. So I went through a whole year. Okay. And I caught up on the credits I missed during summer. I'm up to speed. 
sophomore year, it's like towards the, it's the second semester. I'm in the library. I'm studying with one of my friends and I'm forever grateful to her. She, I don't know what the hell I was doing. Maybe I was sighing and puffing and huffing. I don't know what I was doing. She, in a very quiet library, gets up and she's a very sweet person. And she just goes, that's it. I've had it. Takes my book, slams it shut and says, go home right now and talk to your parents. I can't take it anymore. You're miserable. I was like, what the hell did I do? Whoa. It was literally, we weren't talking. I don't think I said anything, but it gave me the courage. I got in the car, drove home, it was 40 minutes away. And I told my parents, I said, I'm coming home, I want to talk to you. I thought, man, I thought he's going to be so upset. Because my parents are so proud. Like their their son was like the, the path that, you know. And I sat down and I told him I'm not happy. And my dad was like, what do you want to do? I said, I want to completely switch universities. I want to go study business. I was the kid in third grade that had the, the lemonade stand. I mean, I was always trying to do something. And my dad's looking at me and I thought, here we go. And he looks at me and he just goes, it's your life. I love you. I'll support anything you want. Mm. I don't agree, but you got, you got my support. What do you want to do? We got it. So I had to leave the full scholarship. I had to leave all that, hop over to another university, enroll in business school, no guidance, no mentorship. Don't anyone in my family know. The last businessman we had in my family was my mom's father, my grandfather, who I barely knew. He passed away when I was like in kindergarten. Um, so I'm, I'm out and I'm out on my own now. And I get, so junior year, I switch over to universities, lost the full scholarships, and I have my dad's paying 20, 30 grand out of his pocket per year. And within two weeks, Brad, of getting there, I'm in class and I'm like, I hate this. <laughs> I'm like, I don't like this either. Shit, what did I just do? And so I realized that day I went home and I said, I was panicking. I'm like, I'm going to be the hobo in my parents' basement. What is going on with me? <laughs> right. And so I was one superpower I have. And I would encourage everybody to really, really, really try to embrace this is I always tell people I'm super reflective, highly reflective. I try not to be very emotional about decisions. And whenever I'm even in a heated environment, I try to step back right before we started this. I told you, hey, I'm going to be a little bit late. There's an emergency. Well, there's some there's some shit going down right now. Mm. Okay? And the best thing I can do is separate from it. Mm. And let I'm not going to make a decision today. Guess what? I find out as you grow and you learn in time. This is one of those things, right? What is it? What is something you do different uh, past a million? That you still apply urgency, but you realize one thing, and that is that if you give something a little bit more time, it it's always a good thing. And 80% of things resolve themselves. A lot of times, right? A lot of times. A lot of times. So one of my rules is I don't respond to team requests and things until like 2 p.m. Mm. My, fir my, my first half of the day is mine. And you know what I find? They figure shit out. Yep. They don't, they don't have to bother me. So I, back at this point, I, I went into a reflective mode. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close the door, be in my room. And what I realized is my issue wasn't as much as with the education or the classes. I was just, I was ready to go, man. I was like, put me in coach. Mm. Like I'm, I got my helmet on. I got my gear on. I want to play. I don't want to learn how to play. I want to play. So I went, I went to Google and I typed in how to make money. And here's what Google did it auto filled online. And I said, sure. Why the hell not? And that led to an 18 month journey of going through all the envelope stuffing and all this bullshit. And I, back then, can you imagine Google had just launched Facebook didn't exist. Skype didn't exist. I found a chat board called a Blake that I fell in love with where they taught you how to build info products and sell them on ClickBank. Whoa. Now me being a college kid, understanding the value of education and how much I was spending on textbooks. I was like, ah, hmm. education, high value, get it can be sold. I understand this. And that was where I started learning about this world. And it took me forever. Like I said, 18 months of massive struggle before I finally dialed it in. And the first million, as you asked, came from me dialing in um, a few different offers, right? So first thing I did is I started doing consulting. I mean, I probably made my first couple hundred grand in that, which is come on back then. This is 20 years ago, college kid sitting in my dorm room. <laughs> Holy Who, who's, shit. Who's buying consulting right? from a college kid in a dorm room? Yeah, it was SEO black hat shit, right? Yeah, it was like, <laughs> I get like it. how to spam the search engine. I get it. And, um, this is a really, keyword stuffing when you could this, do that. Yeah, exactly. It was, that's what it was. It was a software that would do, that would output 10,000 pages to add to your site that would keyword stuff the shit and it would work like clients would Crazy, get results. Yeah. And so then I built a, I got so tired of doing the client work because gosh, it was overwhelming, man. Four clients a day come and paying me 500 bucks each, two grand, but I got to work like six hours. <laughs> Sounds like I don't want to do that. So I found it. So then I, I, I filmed myself doing the tasks. And I created a sweatshop in my apartment with four of my buddies. <laughs> I bought four 
computer systems to print DVDs, to burn DVDs, packaged together, and the UPS guy, USPS guy, the post service guy would come and grab 10 packages a day from my, and I was selling, I was selling, I'm making two, three, four, five grand a month, I mean a day, selling these packages at 500 bucks. Wow. Um, and then someone told me, dude, why are you doing all this? Why don't you just upload it on the internet and let people have access? I'm like, I don't know technical stuff. I don't, how do you create a members area and all this? This is a funny story. I've never told this before. It's not because I've hidden it, but it just never come up. I find a developer on Freelancer. The dude was a, he was a porn guy. He was like, he made membership sites for porn people. Porn guys are right? the best. Well, he was, he knew what he's doing. <laughs> he yeah, dude, build it porn, right. I mean, you and, know this, porn, porn is the edge of marketing. Yeah, it's where all this shit comes from. They Free the trials most, and all this. Yeah, all comes they from figure that. out marketing before anybody else. Why? Because they can split test something and validate it in one minute. That's yeah, the volume of traffic they get. because the entire world wants it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so he built For better me, or worse. He built me a members area, man. And all of a sudden now I have to, I could, I could fire all my friends. I don't have to have a sweatshop anymore. I could sell as many. I didn't have a USPS guy. This is a really funny story. I get a call from my dad one day because I had built a small email list and I promoted a product from my buddy called, um, his name is Brad Callen. I, he probably, you know, he, he had a software out there out then. And I ended up promoting it to my list of 10,000 people. I made like 35 grand in commission. That was, that was pretty cool. That yeah. was when my eyes were like, Ooh, email plus affiliate marketing, which 20 years later, I still teach. That was like printing money, man. That was, that was just the easiest money I had made. Now, granted, it took time to build that list. So to be clear, but. I, 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 Brad, it wasn't about the money for me anymore. I didn't give a shit. It's a game. These checks came in. I wasn't even cashed. So a check came to my parents' house. It would go to my dad, my parents' house. I get a call again. I'm, I'm at a university 30, 35 minutes away. My dad's like, come home right now. I didn't know if there was some, my mom or someone was sick or whatever. So I rushed home and I get in and my dad is on the phone and he's pissed. He looks pissed. He's on the phone with some company called Kinetics or whatever. I don't even know who they are. I hear him talking. And what I hear, he says, come like this. And I'm like, something's going down. And he's yelling at the person on the phone. And he's like, what do you do? What is this company? I'm like, what's going on? He's like, he, he swore up and down that I was doing something illegal, that I was mm. selling drugs or whatever, because he wanted to know why I got a $35,000 check. Mm. So finally, the company's like, we can't talk to you. We can't tell you crap. Your name's not on the account, blah, 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 blah. So he hangs up. I'm like, dad, hang up. Let me explain. So I like open my computer. I show him the pages. I, I show him like I sent an email. He understanding any of this. So he just looks at me. He goes, so you're not doing anything illegal. I said, dad, I'm not doing anything illegal. Like, Relax. And I will never forget. He just, then he just sits back and he goes, so you're making all this money like part-time in college right now. And it's all legal. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, and you're just getting started. I said, it looks like it. And he leans back and he goes, it's not fair. Uh. <laughs> it was like the best moment. We were like, I'm like, what? He goes, this is crazy. And then he's like, okay, good for you. And um, that was how I, and so I made my first million by digitizing something I was consulting, mm. right? And one of the things that Brad, I continue to seek in my life consistently, and it's, it's easier said than done is, but Tiffany, <laughs> Tiffany was telling her story yesterday on stage, Tiffany high, Tiffany high. She was mm. telling the story on stage where she said, she, she was like, if you had told me I would be a real estate educator. You know, 10 years ago, I'd have been like, what? No, it, these businesses that come out of organic demand are the best, right? So for me back then, the way I became a consultant for that black hat SEO was not because I decided one morning I woke up and said, I will be a consultant. I was on this chat board helping people all the time. I'm sorry. They were helping me all the time. Mm -hmm. I got really good at this software just because I was trying to figure it out. I had nothing better to do. So people were asking questions about the software. And I was like, hey, awesome. I get to help finally and give back to this place. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm answering questions. Next thing I know, someone reaches out and says, hey, can you help me with this? Sure. And I helped them. And they said, can you help my buddy? He'll pay you. So, okay. How much are you going to pay me? 500 bucks. Takes me two hours to install the software and run it. 250 bucks an hour for a broke college kid. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. And so next thing I know, he refers me, he refers me, he refers me. And now I have a consulting practice. And then I'm like, well, I'm tired of doing this. I don't want to do this so much. It's boring. So someone gives me the idea of like, why don't you film it? So I, I filmed and I made uh, 10 courses and I had 10 boxes in my dorm. I didn't think it was going to work, honestly. I think like, such a big difference between a consulting done for you and a box of videos. Yeah. So I was like, I'll throw this out. I have a small email list at this point of people that are interested in. And what era is this? What time period? It's 2004. Yeah, right. So for frame, for you know the people that aren't our age, <laughs> uh, 
that period of time, and you framed it a little bit, which is Facebook didn't exist, mm -hmm. right? And I think at that time, Facebook was finally just out. No, 06. It was just out, yeah. Uh, started in 06. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so it didn't. Okay. So didn't exist at all. And more importantly, uh, the tools to execute didn't exist. No. So if you wanted to build a website, like, do you know Sam Bell? Yeah. So love Sam. Yeah. yeah. So Sam was my... Uh, I invested in this company, realestateinvestor.com, in 2007, yeah. which is no longer. But I met Sam through that. And Sam was selling a product from Stage, which was how to create a website. Okay. And it, <laughs> it was like... And that would work. Yeah, I can see. It was like the WordPress install, cPanel, you know, like how do you get a website up and running? Yeah. And yeah. nobody knew then. Yeah. Like it, it was a $2,000 course, how to build a website. Do you, do, you know, um, do you know the company Squarespace? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you want to hear a crazy story? Yeah, totally. It started right below me. So oh, really? in my dorm room, senior year, uh, Anthony, Tony, the guy, the founder, he was in the same entrepreneurship program I was in called Hinman CEOs. And he was creating this thing. And I was fascinated by it. And I mean, by now I had a community of affiliate marketers. So mm -hmm. I, I had a recurring continuity program that was doing pretty well. I was doing, I mean, when I, that senior year, I was already past a million a year in revenue. So I was like the poster child of their entrepreneurship training. So I went to him and uh, I wanted to, I wanted Squarespace. I thought, I thought, I'm being honest with you. It's so funny. I thought it was the stupidest. I'm like, what are you doing? This is like stupid. Like there's like, there's blogger and there's like WordPress, I think was already out. And there's like other, I'm like, what are, you, what are you wasting your time with this? I said, but I see a, a I see a purpose for it for my affiliate marketers because like, mm -hmm. I can auto build sites for them and have stuff done. So I made him an offer. Dude, I walked in with swag for that offer. I made him a hundred thousand dollar cash offer. Okay. That's pretty baller back in like 20, to, to buy the company. Yeah. To just buy the company. <laughs> I said, you don't know what you're doing, all right? <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna do you a favor. I'm gonna give you 100 grand cash. Take this off your hands. I need you to stick around for six months until I find a developer. And he he considered it. He is like, well, let me think. Now, Anthony, T Tony or Anthony, I don't know how he goes by now. I can't remember, but um, he he was your tech entrepreneur. Like he kind of quiet, edgy. You know, he looked at me. I remember being in his dorm room. He showed me a demo. And he was like, yeah, I don't know. Let me think about it. I'm like, you stupid. What is there to think about you? I'm handing you $100,000 cash. Like, so the next day or day or day or two later, he turned me down. And um, uh, I'm glad he did. <laughs> so he went on to become a multi-billionaire. But I, uh, I, that's, that's the era <laughs> that right. I come from, right? Well, it's I wanted like, to set that stage are... because the, that's in a really important frame in uh, knowing when you're figuring out marketing that... T the easiest way to success is to not reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. and just copy what somebody else did. Yeah. Follow the fucking plan. Yeah. But there wasn't the plan then, mm -mm. right? Everybody's trying to figure out yep. marketing online. And online was so new and commerce was so new online yeah. that nobody knew what worked and what didn't. Beyond a Million is brought to you by Easy Pay Direct. If you're an entrepreneur and you are still using a product like Stripe or PayPal to accept payments, it is time to find out why the largest names in your industry would never consider doing that. Check out easypaydirect.com forward slash BAM to find out more. Yep. So you're doing this through college, which is wild. Um, you make your first million at by senior year in college. Mm -hmm. um, at what point do you have some kind of formal business where it's not just you in a dorm room so, selling shit. Okay. So I graduate and I leave college. I don't know what the hell to do with myself. So I did. Yeah, I moved into my parents' house. I didn't know where I was speaking. I was traveling all the time. Okay. <laughs> Why would you do that? Well, because I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what to do. Right. And well, it I'm, sounds I'm, like you got a good support network with your pops. So my, my, my parents are freaking awesome. So, so I, um, I was on the road all the time. I didn't have time to even like go look for a place and like, do I buy a place or I rent a place? I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right. So I just quick, quick, like I just moved into their house as like a temporary solution. And then I needed like, I don't know. I, I needed a couple people to help me. My first employee, if I told you I hired my first employee, you're going to, you're going to crack up. Okay. I don't recommend anybody hire like this. This is the worst way to hire. It worked out for me. I met one of my close friends house one night, Friday night. We're drinking. We're taking shots of whiskey. I have no idea why. Um, it makes no sense. But we were doing shots of Shivas. Shivas Regal. No, you, no one takes shots of Shivas Regal. But no. that's, we, we were, whatever, right? And uh, there's three of us. 
It's the other third guy I went to high school with. I know him. I wouldn't say we're like friend friends, but I know him really well. He's really close friends with my friend. We're all drinking. And at one point, I am at, I'm at this thing and I'm like drunk at this point. And I'm like, oh man, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. I need help. Like I need someone to come and help me do this. Like, my business is exploding and I don't know what to do. And at the same time, the guy across, the other guy, the third guy is like, man, I'm home all day. I'm just like bored out of my mind. I need a job. I need something. My parents are threatening to kick me out of the house. And da, da, da. and my friend is sitting in the middle and he's like, <laughs> right? And I remember this. He goes, you really drunk. Was, you hire him. And you go work for him. And so I'm like, okay. And that's it. That's the conversation. Two days later, Monday morning. Uh, I used to always get up late until the day I would love to get up late. I would work late at night, get up late. So my mom comes, my mom comes to wake me up. This is such a bad story. Right. I'm like making seven figures and my mama comes to wake me up from, from my room. <laughs> and she's like, Hey, get up, get up. Someone's at the door. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, someone's at the door. He's asking for you. I'm like, what are you talking about, mom? She's like, someone's at the door. He's got a suit on and stuff and he's asking for you. I said, all right, so I, this is back 20 years ago when we would still like answer the door and not think that it's like a serial murderer there to kill us. <laughs> so I go down, it's freaking this guy, Andrew. It's, I'm like, Andrew, what the hell are you doing here? He's got a suit on, he has a briefcase in his hand. <laughs> and he's like, he's like bottom lip quivers. He's like, you, 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 you hired me. I hired you for what? Now you gotta understand, I've known him since high school. The dude, in high school, we were, I was thoroughly convinced he was going to be the guy that did like the mass shootings. He used to wear a straight jacket. He was weird, long hair, strange guy. I made friends with him on purpose to make sure that if some shit goes down. I don't get it. I don't get it. We were really like, we all used to keep our, so I'm like, I did not hire you, dude. I don't want you in my house in my basement working. I don't, I don't know you like that. But he's like, so I was like, all right, fine, get in here, Andrew. So he goes downstairs to where my office is set up. And I'm like, what the hell's in the briefcase? It's <laughs> briefcase. It's empty. There's not one piece of paper oh, in it. there. Playing the part. And I'm like, what the? He's like, I don't know, man. People bring briefcases. I brought a briefcase. Maybe <laughs> you have shit to give me. And I'm like, we are an online business. I don't have any paperwork. So that was my first employee. After that, a couple weeks in, I'm like, shit, I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't know who to ask. I just no one in my family to help me with this. So I go back to the university, go back to that program, Hinman, and I'm like, guys, help. And so they're like, oh, there's an incubator here. Go join this incubator. Mm. So... The incubator had a 1% selection rate. Mm. So I applied. I got selected. Part of that, they give you an office on campus. They give you some guidance and leadership. Now, what's funny is the first thing they said is you need someone. Where's your financial records? I'm like, I don't know. I got them somewhere here. Like They're like, do you have books? I'm like, what are we fucking talking about? And here's a weird thing. You know what my bachelor's degree is in? Mm. Finance. <laughs> Dude, it's so sad. It is so sad. Right? So anyways, he... um. So they're like, well, there's a guy here as a CFO in a box. He works on a couple of the companies in the, in this, we'll let him bring. His name is Rich. Still till this day, he is my CFO. He's not a CFO in a box oh, anymore. Wow. He's my full time guy. So this is, we're going on probably 18 years now. Wow. But he comes up. So he's going to work for me one day a week and I'll never forget this. And he says, he comes up, puts his laptop on the, on his desk and he's like, so he's like, Hey, how do I log into, into your QuickBooks? I'm like, my what? He's like, your accounting system. Oh my God, man. I'm like, accounting system? This is brutal. Yeah. And he, it, this is exactly what he said. He goes, do you have any kind of accounting system? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you, what do you want? And he's like, this is not good. And he goes, like, how do you keep track of payments you've made and money that's come in? And I'm like, oh, dude. Oh, sh say it like that. I got you, man. I know. I got it all. You know what I did? I pulled out. I had in my office because I brought it for him. I had three boxes. Okay, dude. I gave him three boxes. And it was old school, dumb and dumber style, freaking paid Andrew $300 on this date on one piece of paper. And everyone had a piece of paper and they were in no order. And he's looking at me and he's like, what the hell is this? And I'm like, it's a record of everything I've oh paid. Oh my God. And he's like, dude, how have you done your taxes? I'm like, well, I don't know. My dad and the accountant did some shit last year and I paid my taxes. I paid a big amount. And he goes, he literally just looks at me. He's like, get out of my office. He's like, I got work to do. So he cleans me up and gets it. So it's like, I, that would be when I, I think, I think when I officially first finally set up a business was when Rich came in because he was like, are you incorporated? No. Do you have an EIN? What the hell is that? Where's your accounting system? I don't know what you're talking about. And so he came in, he put all the structure in place and that would be, so that was in 2000, um, that was like early 2006. 
And that was when we officially became a business. And after that, I mean, I had major health issues. I was in the hospital. I was in the ICU, nearly died. I had so many ups and downs. But um, yeah, man, it was it was a crazy story. You know, I'm, I'm not supposed to be... I didn't have the, the makeup to be an entrepreneur. But it also goes to tell you, like, how much do we today get fixated on these things, these details? Because we want all the T's crossed and I's dotted. Mm-hmm. When what we realize is true entrepreneurship is just doing... And creating that opportunity and that value. And he, I'm not downplaying the other stuff. You need the plans. You need the SOPs. You need the KPIs. You need all that. But that's not what creates. That's not what creates. I always tell people, this is what I tell my students and people in my mastermind. I say, marketing launches businesses. Operations will scale them. Love that. But an operation, great operations teams will not launch a business. The launching part needs to be done by a tornado. It needs to be done by an entrepreneur who's not going to worry about all that shit. Well, you have a, I mean, the... Some of the takeaways with your history, and when you look at your path, there was a very clear um, ecosystem of performance, preparation, and excellence that 100%. brought you to a point yes. that allowed you to make choices. Yes. And that's also a tremendous failure point for entrepreneurs mm-hmm. because many of them just try to execute. Mm-hmm. And you have to, you know, you were playing a different game, but it brought you to today, yeah. right? And that the network that you had, what you, what you kept coming back to was the network that you had, family mm-hmm. or the incubator, mm-hmm. right? The program that you were in. Always people. All of the credibility always, always from always. the prep and the hard work mm-hmm. allowed you to have the ecosystem to ask questions when you were confused and didn't know where you were going. Literally, that was the number one. I have always been a problem solver through other people. Since day one. So when I, when someone said, film yourself doing the thing and record it and burn it on a DVD, man, I did not know how to do that. There was a software called Screencast that had just come out. So how did I discover that? I went to the forum and I asked, right? And they told me about it. Now, I don't know what the hell to do with it. So I paid someone to spend some time and show me in my school. I had a, I had a buddy who was technical. I said, here's 30 bucks. Show me how to use this thing. So he came in and he showed me how to use it. And then burning a DVD. I don't want to burn a DVD, right? I, hey, here's another 20 bucks. Show me how to burn a damn DVD. Burning DVD. Right? Like it's, it's, but, but along the way, it's still till this day, man. I don't know. All right. Right now we're launching and I'm, I'm in the middle of building a tech company and I have failed to build tech for 20 years now. I have burned probably, I actually have figured the exact number. It's around $12 million trying to build tech companies mm. because I'm not technical. So I constantly keep looking for someone else to lead that and it just does not work. So the current platform that I'm trying to build, I have to build it. This is like, no, this is needed. The market needs it. I want to build it. I got to build it. It's a big opportunity, but we were really struggling. So I hired a guy and I did it the old way. And I hired him snap in a year, a year ago. And I t- he left and I'm glad he did it four, three, four months ago. And again, I was left with a project that was only partially complete and not ready to go. And I'm like, here we go again, right? I wasted about another hundred grand. I said, I gotta stop doing it this way. So what I did now is I got myself in there and I said, I don't need, to, I'm not, I'm gonna, I don't need to code, but I gotta understand. Because if I don't understand, then they're going to run circles around me. So now I've built a team around me. So I have the team that's doing, and I have three people here that I've hired that I just pay hourly to consult. So the team that's doing doesn't know what that, they'll talk to me. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, let me think about that. Get back. I don't know what the fuck they're talking about, but I take that information I take it to these guys. I process and I come back. So I've always from day one, from the smallest thing to now the biggest decisions that sometimes now I'm. Uh, I'm dealing with a decision that is multi millions of dollars. I have to find a path to resolve something that could turn into a negative multi millions. Or my best case scenario is I'm made whole. My worst case scenario is I lose millions. But I'm not going to move fast. I'm going to collect my info. I'm going to talk to the right people. Um, and I'm going to make it a informed decision only once I feel like I've collected all the data points that I need. Yeah. That's, that's not something I learned in the process of building a bit, I was always like that. And I don't care. I don't need it to be my win. I'm not, I don't have an ego. I just want the right outcome. And if that's because Brad gave me some advice, good. Right? Well, that self-awareness is usually developed over time through entrepreneurship. It's uncommon to have it a different way. Um, so we've got yeah. backdrop of chaotic figuring out how to market, Yeah, hiring, your first employee while hammering in the basement. 
uh, and now a fractional CFO tapping the resources that you had from a very deliberate structured upbringing. Hmm. Um, you most recently had a multi eight figure company that ran inadvertently headfirst into the FTC. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the, the jump to the multi eight figure company and grow, first off, like growing that. And what was the shift from your previous, all of this stumbling to figure out the elements of life mm -hmm. to then being able to scale to that point? Cause yeah. I want to talk FTC cause it's really important to people. Yeah. Yeah. But first, like, how did you, what was the shift that you had? Uh, it was, it was, um, it was the hardest business to build. And many a times I think back to myself and I'm like, the amount of time and energy that we built, put into building that business, had I put that same, the talent, the people talent, the time, the energy and all that, had I put that into a software business or gosh, any other business, a real estate business, I mean, we would we would be worth probably a billion dollars by now, right? But I chose to build a publishing company. And by publishing company, I mean not just publishing my material, but publishing the material of other people, which was a blessing as well. So I don't mean to make it sound bad. I got connected to and I got a chance to work with Robert Kiyosaki, Damon, John Les Brown, Bob Proctor, and all these people um, and other marketers who are great. So the basis of my um, business and decision was this. I got very good at marketing and selling information to a certain market. I could take my information and do very well with it. This is before I understood paid traffic well. And so I had built this audience, but there's only so many things I'm good at that I feel comfortable teaching and being the expert on. So I was like, well, I've got this audience and they're really, they love me and they love my company and they're ready to buy more. What if I take Brad's expertise mm. and co-publish with him, co-build a product based off his expertise and I allow him to tap into my network. He doesn't have the audience. I have the audience distribution channel. Boom. We make a deal. So I did a few of those. They did really, really well. And before I knew it, I was like, let's become a publishing house. And my, my assumption, which was a false assumption was that, oh, here's me doing 10 million a year now with my content, my info. I find five of me's, I'm doing 50 million. And the, although mathematically that's a very linear and makes sense, it just doesn't play out that way because the problem with this business model is there are very limited people in the world to employ who know how to run a $10 million info product. Mm. So, and if they're hard enough to find for one brand, how the hell are you going to find them for five or six or seven brands? Not to mention, I'm selling really well because my hook, my topic, and all of that resonates. The next person's may or may not. And when I launch them, if they're only a two, $3 million brand, they're pulling from my $10 million brand. So my $10 million brand falls to 7 million and they become 3 million. We're still doing 10 million. Like that was the hardest thing from to break through. And so in 2020, here's what, here's what I heard. I want to recap that. Yeah. So, and tell me if I'm right on this, but yeah. What I heard was the crux of the business model. One is operationally hiring the right people and 100%. just finding the right people yes. to execute. And the other was in the publishing world and in that industry, the marketing hook, the angle that you're taking, the, the USP it's everything. is everything. It's everything. And so it, because it's such a challenge, when you find something, you catch fire. Yeah. But it's hard to find it. 100%. It's, 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 um, it takes more time. We were, I was making a more general assumption that the funnel, the team, and the mechanisms are what are creating the success. And I, although they are very important, the offer is key. Mm. It starts with the offer and the hook is a big part of the offer. So if you don't have that sexy offer, you can't, you can have all the mechanisms in place that you want. You, it's it. not going to go anywhere. So this is the lesson to like fucking 99% of the audience yeah. is spend a disproportionate amount of time on your offer. Oh my God. And it's, I can't, it's... I mean, you know this because it's your whole world, but yeah. the number of people, if, if we ask even our friend group, like high performing entrepreneurs, yeah. most of them will not give you a distilled clear version of their USP. Yeah. Most of them still stumble around what they do mm -hmm. and how they do it. I have said the following many times, and I believe this now having been through it, it's that if you're struggling to scale, 
I can pretty much guarantee you the problem is not your traffic. It's not your conversions. It's not anything other than your offer. Because when your offer is amazing, scale comes, the rest falls in place. And I like to use an extreme example to make my point. It's a super exaggerated example, but let's just say I hold the solo license in the world to sell $300,000 Lamborghinis for $10,000. Mm -hmm. Certified, valid, confirmed. Lamborghinis even said, he got us, dude's legit. So I sell $300,000 Lamborghinis for $10,000. That's my USP. How much marketing, traffic generation, and copy and funnels do you think I need to scale my business? Zero. Zero. Yep. It'll do it on its own. Yep. And so it's an extreme, exaggerated example. Now, I'll also tell you this. So I love Alex Ramosi's book, $100 Million Offers. And I think the only thing I think is underspoken about related to that book is how effing hard it is to deliver a hundred million dollar offer mm. creating man you and i can sit down we can create the sexiest offers in the world um here brad i'll create an offer um zero zero cost you know what process with us we'll pay you two percent of processing and this is the no crux, fees this is the crux of information products yeah. because and well this will lead us directly into fdc yeah because you can promise the world but if you don't fucking deliver it that's a problem and yeah. you're dead on, yep. right? It's so, easy to say the words, but you got you got to back them up with it. With, and, and if you can, the, the the beauty of the magic though is if you can do that, yeah, then you're, you're good luck trying to manage the scale. Right. It's going to come on its own, and that has taken me 20 years to figure out. So now, where I sit in my business today, as I'm recrafting, rearchitecting, and building, I'm constantly analyzing the reaction of audience and people to my offer and to my presentation. And I'm not taking it personal. All I know is that if I'm not getting the response I want, my offer sucks. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Fix it. Let's continue to get to a place and to a point where it's a no brainer. I I've, I was at a, um, I was at an event and I'll keep names out just out of respect. I was at an event and I saw how they do things and I just, I learn by observing. I don't learn by taking courses because I just have way too much ADD for that. So I'm watching and I start talking to the team members of this person, right? And um, and respectfully, the person who's running the event has told the team, hey guys, open books to on it. Go ahead and you know answer whatever questions. And so I'm seeing how they're doing it. And all of a sudden I see one thing and I'm like, shit. It unlocked for me this offer I have, which is a great offer, but it's not selling well because it's just not you know, it's taking a, too much resistance to sell it, but I saw something here and I'm like, oh shit, bring this here, reposition here. I don't have to change any of the deliverables. I have to reposition how it's said. And all of a sudden it's turning into an offer that people are like, Hey, how do I, I want this. So it's a big, big key factor. So going back to just wrap up the publishing house and the publishing business. And, and, and I just did not understand that until until I did. And when I dialed, so in 2020, our business starts to do really well as most people in the info world because of, well, we were already having a couple of rockets attached to our assets before COVID. Yeah. But then COVID happens and like all info marketing businesses took off. And so we're really exploding. And I'm, I mean, I had bags under my eyes. I may have a lot of money in the bank account, but I was driving miserable, man. I was like, so I just said, I had a lot of money though. So I was like, screw this. I'm done. I'm changing my hiring. So I went out for two, three months. Again, as I do, problem solve. How do I hire? What do mm -hmm. I do? I hired the top experts to teach me how to hire. And I went and I just started boom, 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 poaching the creme de la creme, right? I made them offers they couldn't refuse. Um, I charmed my way and I got them and they were big, big, big changes. I mean, that was finally when we unlocked. We went from 10 million to 30 million in a year and a half because of that. And, and in a way that I was pretty sane. My wife gets pregnant. We're going to have a kid April, 2022. My wife gives birth to our first baby girl. And, um, I'm in the middle of acquisition. I'm being acquired. I got a great acquisition offer and I was super happy to have it. I was like, I, I am, you know, it's a great business. I love it. My right hand is ready to step up and be the CEO, but I'm done, man. 20 years of slogging at this. I want to do something different. I'm tired. Someone told me once, I wish I'd never heard this. My best friend told me this number. I hate him for it. He said the average entrepreneur's life cycle is seven years in the business that they do. And I was like, F you for saying that you mess my head up. Right. Cause I've been doing this for 20 years. And yeah. so like now all I want is out. <clears throat> like it's, and again, nothing wrong with the business. I just, I love the business. I love what we built. I just wanted to do something different. So, um, we, we dialed it in though. We, I was out for a month when my, 
wife gave birth to our kid and the business was running. We were growing, scaling. We dialed in how to pick the right offers, how to find the right publishing people to publish. We've, we had the right team makeup. I had the right leadership in place. And so I was like, wow, I, I, I can actually run this business now like we all dream, which is like by just advising my own team members. And so I have this baby and I'm in the middle of this acquisition. The acquisition due diligence is complete. We're good. It was actually our second, the first acquisition we were done and good. I walked away from it in March. I engage a new one. This one's moving super fast. We're through through their due diligence as well. It's end of April. I'm like, man, I really love being a dad. Like I want to be present to this child. And so I'm going to step down. I think my, my right hand, we initially, the goal was we would do the transition of power at the time of um, acquisition, yep. right? He would go on to continue being CEO post acquisition. I would leave. And I was like, I don't want to wait that long. Yep. I just let him, let him shepherd this acquisition. Like, I know it's now. coming. What's that? I said, I know what's coming. <laughs> Dude. Oh man. I, I, I hate reliving this shit every time I talk about it, but I, you know what? I have to, I want people to understand this because it's, it's, this is how life can kick you in the balls too sometimes. And it's just, is part of being part of what we do. Yep. Right. So that's end of April. I make the decision. I tell my wife, I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go back. First thing I do when I get back to work is I'm going to let Joe know that he's CEO now. And I'm going to announce it on my birthday. My birthday is June 14th. One of my biggest dreams was to sell my business before I turned 40. That was my 39th birthday. So my 39th birthday, I'm going to announce to the team. Everyone on my team loves Joe. So it would be a, it would be a very welcome celebrated message. I'm stepping down. He's coming in. So I get back. It's uh, I get back on May, early May 20, May 20th, whatever. I get back from maternity, paternity leave. Three days later, Friday, FedEx package. God. FedEx package from hell. Well, from the Federal Trade Commission. And I don't mean any disrespect when I said that. I just mean to say it brought hell into my life. And the minute I knew what it was. And the minute I saw the front desk person walk in, my lawyer was dialing me at the same time. And then she's walking in. And I was like, that's it. I knew because I, I, I understood I was in a risky space. I thought I had covered my ass. Dude, I've never been sued. I've never had an, I've never had a state AG look at me. I've never even got a call from a state AG. I don't even know what they are. I have never had an issue with a customer. I've had 250,000 customers since 2015. Never had a single issue worldwide. I just didn't think I was the guy that needed to be taken. There was a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but the minute I opened that FedEx package to learn that there was a civil investigative document inside of it, the dream of selling the company gone on the spot, right? I call the, I call the PE firm. I'm like, Hey, yeah, uh, <clears throat> just a little, it's not an issue, right? Guys, we'll work through this. And it's like, click. I'm like, okay, that's done. Wow. Um, I'm not going to step down as CEO now. That would be a dick move to, you know, and, and not that I, it, it wasn't, it wasn't possible. And, uh, here I went from being able to spend all my time with my baby girl to now having to, I was wartime CEO now trying to figure this out. So it was going to limit my time. Super, super, super tough. 18 months dealing with that. So tell me what that was. So what was the issue with the FTC? Like just yeah. bla the black and white, what were you being pursued for? Uh, things we said in our webinars that they found to that were against their rules. Um, and I want to, I want to clarify this because th like the external world, if they see federal government suit, um, most of them condemn the business owner immediately. Immediately, yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. anybody that's inside the world or interacts with the FTC knows mm -hmm. that the FTC is the antithesis of what our government proceedings are supposed to be, mm -hmm. which is they condemn you to guilt yeah. until you're proven innocent, it's, which is not how it's supposed to work. Yeah. And, and so I, I start by saying this, look, I, I continue, even after having been through this process, I continue to be a supporter. I actually think their creation, their purpose is one I support. And most of the people that they, I've watched them take down, I've been on the sidelines really plotting. Um, I don't, I don't agree with some of the approach that they take. And I think being American, that's my issue. Yeah. Being American, I think I'm okay to say that it's, um, I don't agree with the, how they do it. Definitely guilty before proven innocent. Right. I mean, it, it's one, it's like you are, you, you, you just, it's a, here's the thing, right? So I got a 32, 30, here's a part of what I don't agree with. So I got a 32, 33 page document with a massive list of stuff that just so you know, took us almost 10 months to actually deliver. It cost me millions of dollars in, in legal fees, discovery fees, forensic companies. I mean, they Jesus. wanted, it was detailed. No, it's very difficult to deliver all that, but you got to. While running your business. While trying to. We're trying yeah. to, yeah. yeah. And while, new dad, right? So 
Um, but we asked one simple question and I wanted, wouldn't answer it. I said, why, what got, why are you here? <laughs> you know, what did, is it? A, it's not complaints. Like guys, we don't, we get about 20 BBB complaints a year off of 20,000 transactions and they're all resolved. They're all resolved. We have an A rating at the BBB. We have no issues with our merchant processors. We have a 0.8% chargeback rate. It's below. It's like 0.76% chargeback rate. We have a below 5% refund rate on literally 20 some thousand transactions a year, right? We And we were working with two main merchant accounts and PayPal. We've been with the same ones forever. So they love our business. We don't round robin merchant balance this, that. We don't do any of this nonsense. Like we we're in a four million dollar facility that we built that i publicly talk about i'm there every day like i'm not hiding I, I don't understand like why are you here and i don't mean that disrespectfully i just want to know like we'll fix it what's 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 up like we'll fix what's wrong well why this is too much like this is ridiculous and and the answer is we don't have to tell you anything and i'm like well hmm. that seems a little bit unfair if you're gonna ask me for something that took me millions of dollars 10 months and was the most intrusive thing that's ever happened in my life. And all I'm asking is what, what got you here? I kind of feel like I'd love some answers. And so they don't, and they don't have to, and it is what it is. It's okay, fine. But, and you, you've got to look at what they ask you and what they say. That's the best clues you can get us to. So you look at the actual investigative document and they would quote things said in my webinars that sometimes I think I got excited because I love what I sell and, and I said things and they would consider those claims. So here's the deal. The FTC, from what I was told by attorneys, right? Now I'm not in the FTC, so I can't back this, validate it, but I was told for years and I built my company to protect, to and then it, it worked. Like I built my company around what I was told by, because I had a full-time paralegal in my business reviewing all the sales calls. Like we were, I did about as much as I possibly could, as I knew. So we were told, look, they're complaint driven. They are there to protect the consumers. So when consumers start complaining, they show up. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, yeah that is fair. Fair enough. And like, that's what they should do. And 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 I, uh, even being in the industry, I'm like, hey, if I am selling a service or a product that is scamming people and people are profusely complaining, right. I deserve to go down. But, but doesn't seem like that's how it works. That's not at least not anymore. Right now, it is about the letter of the law. So. You are there. These are the policies, the terms, and these are the, you know, the things. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. I don't think a lot of the attorneys who call themselves compliance attorneys really actually know. I have found maybe two or three at this point that I really understand, seek the counsel of. And it took me being in the process, which is the worst way to learn, to now be able to sit and say, okay, I can actually look at copy from the eyes of the FTC and say whether it's compliant or not, yep. which is part of why this has become my mission now and going out and trying to help people and tell people. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was words and things in the, in the, in the webinars. It was claims. It was implied claims. It was making people feel like they're going to make a lot of money. And it was um, not having enough success stories to back up the typicality of those claims. That was really where they started. Um, and then once they found out we had a telesales team, we were doing one-to-one -one sales, it, the case became all about that. And that's a whole Supreme Court ruling reason, section 1319, like we can get into that. But, um, well, I want to talk about just some of the granular things that are takeaways. So like the, if you're, if you're marketing period, but the more aggressive you are, the more relevant this becomes. And, and also the larger your client base is, the more relevant this is, right? Yep. Because if you have a ton of clients that the one, the 5% refunds is a big number, mm -hmm. uh, not percentage wise, but just human wise. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what do you think that there's a size at which you need to start paying more attention to the FTC? I thought I don't anymore. Not after having worked with, um, Greg, who's my business partner in this and, um, <clears throat> the attorney, I mean, he's got a slew of cases and we have found a lot. I've done my research on this of cases where the company was doing a million bucks a year, a few hundred grand a year, they get taken down. You know, there's a big myth and that's the, the FTC keeps the money. A lot of people think that this is like a fundraising plan for the government, the evil administration. It's not, they don't keep the money. They actually had some big PR issue about this. Greg was telling me years ago where they've become very good. So my fine ended up being two and a half million dollars 
that two and a half million will go back to the consumers. They don't get to keep. So they're negative. They they probably spent oh, over a million bucks investigating me, maybe more, maybe a million and a half. I have no idea, but they spent a lot of money. So they don't get to keep any of it. Now, I'm sure they get a win on their, I'm sure there's like other incentives for mm -hmm. it, but they don't get money. <clears throat> And so they don't really care. If you're breaking the rules, you're breaking the rules. One of Greg's clients had to settle for his watch. That was his settlement. He had, he had a $30,000, $35,000 watch. And he sold it and gave it to him. So what do people need to know when they're putting out marketing claims to Man, stay off the FTC's radar? So the number one entry right now they're just really looking at is testimonials and endorsements. So if you are using results-driven testimonials, you are inviting them. Greg said it best yesterday on stage when we started. He said, if you want to know whether you are at risk of having them come through your door, proverbial door, not your physical door, um, go to your case studies and client results section of your copy. And if you are giving testimonials that are specific results driven, so, hey, um, I took Brad's course, made $32,000, then you better A, have a written release affidavit from that client, B, have substantiation of it. Just because I said I made $32,000, now you put that in your copy, it's your claim. You need to substantiate it. So you need to turn around and ask me to prove that I made $32,000, right? Which is an uncomfortable conversation and all the more reason to not use results-driven and results-based testimonials, but you need to have that. And it made sense. I never understood why. I'm like, what the heck, man? I'm taking their word for it. I took a screenshot out of a Facebook post they made in a face public Facebook group Right. And, but the thing is, as long as it's in a public area and it's their post, it's their claim, not mine. But the minute I take a screenshot of it and put it in my marketing, it's my claim now. And I got to substantiate it. Fair mm -hmm. enough. The third rule is typicality. So here's the thing. If I have, you know, Greg gives this example of one of his cases where the company was using this, um, case study, which was proven. They had all the substantiation. They had all the backing. They had a signed release where this guy had made a million dollars using their options trading program. But what they failed to disclose in 30 days, made a million bucks in 30 days. So now they're out there talking about this and, and using this case study and testimonial. And what they failed to also say is that the person began with $7 million of investable capital. Not typical. Not typical. Right. Most people get you 10, 20, 30 grand. So the chance of them making a million is nil to none, even if they follow to the T. So the third rule is typicality. And it, you know, the, the first thing marketers say to typicality is they say, well, most of my people don't actually do anything with the course. So the typical, okay, fine. You can be specific. You can say, so as long as you change how you talk, if you say, Hey, the average result of a customer who completes our blah, 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 blah is but you've got to have an actual study done. You can't be like, oh, I think it's the, you know, it's got to be through surveys, through, there's a whole way you, and we highly recommend you get a third party company, a lawyer, or a legal firm to basically come in and certify that and say, yes, we've looked at the evidence and we believe that this is a typicality, you know, statement. Then you can use results driven testimonials that are substantiated and signed releases but that are within around that typical number and not like on the, <clears throat> you can't cherry pick. This is what they say word for word. What I've picked up from Greg. So they say, you can't cherry pick your top yep. and just use those and because so it the, creates so, a bad impression. Yeah, well, there, there was a time with the FTC where you could say, this is not a, not typical a typical result, yeah. right? Results, not typical. And you yeah. would use your cherry picked high mm -hmm. end uh, result. Yeah. They changed those guys. That's no longer acceptable. They change. Now, number four, the fourth rule of using testimonials is you still got to have the disclosures. I find the disclosures and disclaimers to be a really interesting conversation, which I don't fully understand. Um, so I leave that to Greg. Um, and that is, I, I said it this way. I said, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, but I get it. I do get it. Actually. It's not that I don't get it. So here's the thing that they're trying to say, like, just because you disclose, doesn't mean you can break the rules. So the rule says the testimony has to be typical. You can't use an atypical testimonial and then say it's not typical and hence be okay. You just, but if you use a typical testimonial, you still have to have a proximity, uh, a disclosure within proximity of that testimonial. Meaning so like, that if you're running a testimonial video right next to it, while the testimonial is happening, the disclosure the, has to be visible there. Visible, not hidden, and 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 maybe can't be a footnote. And if there is no visual, like if they can't see a visual because it's something that's an audio, then it has to auditorily you have to put a disclosure. So it it itself doesn't protect you, but not having it hurts you. So mm. you still have to have it, but that doesn't 
nullify you from all the other rules. So look, we, there's, I mean, I've, I'm doing presentations on this that are taking me three hours to get through like the key things that yeah. the FTC, but this, they have actually issued releases saying, this is our focus area, right? So if you are using testimonials that are results driven, that are not typical, that's going to be the door through which they enter. And that was with us as well. That was the first reach out was the first things they were asking about. In, in yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, those are good bullets for people in general. And like you said, there, you know, there's a whole industry around defending this mm -hmm. and um, case law and the ever changing industry and yeah. the landscape. But having a few bullets of this is how I can execute is yeah. kind of the, the point of sitting here. Right. And it's the point yeah, of like, yeah, that's absolutely. a, that's an entry point for everybody yeah. to say, this is what I should do. Well, look, man, I know you're pressed for time. Um, uh, we will talk more in a couple of weeks, actually yeah. 10 days at your event. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but where uh, do you want to point people? Where can people find so, out more about you? Uh, so a couple places, right? So number one is if you're more curious about the, the guidelines, the FTC compliance and protecting yourself, here's what I tell people. And I want to be really clear about this because I'm getting a bit of a reaction from marketers, which I expected, but it's too, marketers are very extreme, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, I'm either holy hell not compliant or I'm holy hell compliant. Mm. And they're scared shitless of the holy hell compliant because they're convinced that being fully compliant means no sales. And I'm here to say, that's not true. I'm running stuff now that Greg says is compliant. I'm good to go. And trust me, I have to be extra careful because I'm under a signed agreement now also with the FTC. with the FTC and it's converting and I feel great about it. And people, I'm getting better customers that are spending more. So I'm actually really happy. It's really weird, but I'm like, I choose compliant marketing regardless of my signed releases. But here's what I want to tell people. There's a bunch of other things. There's the FCC, there's class action lawsuits, there's state AGs, there's personal, there's consumer lawsuits, contractual, there's all these. So as you, as soon as you go into business, this is your risk. And my, my encouragement to those who are watching is this, you are not going to go from here to here. You, you're never going to be zero risk. And. I'm just saying, can we work together? Can you educate and for, can we reduce, 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 reduce this portion of this risk? This portion is really easy. Some changes to privacy policy, some change terms. The bulk of it. Yeah. A big chunk, a big chunk of risk you can remove by the simple things that we can do. Now that last 30% where we got to train your muscles to, to speak different, to talk different. Okay. Well, we, you don't have to do it tomorrow. Let's work on it one at a time. So we have a podcast. We have a book. All of that's at don'tsaythat.com. We have a free assessment service. So people can check it all out. Go to don'tsaythat.com. And I think what I say is just be open-minded. But first, you have to accept the fact that you need to be compliant and that you need to know the law. You need to understand it. It's the biggest risk factor you have in your business. Not economic, not recession, not employees, not product, not customer. Your biggest happened to me. I lost a 40 million a year company. I lost a multi deca million acquisition, right? I lost the ability to have freedom in my life and to go be with my daughter all because of one FedEx package from one agency. So take it seriously, decide you want to do it and then go get informed. And we're here to help. That's a big part of my mission. Now don't say that.com. Now, if you're listening, you're like, dude, I don't want to listen to all this bullshit. Like I, I don't, I don't want all the negative crap. I don't want this. Gives, this gives me anxiety yeah. on it. Can you, can you show me how you grew a business so fast that the FTC even cared about you? Yeah. Like, that's cool. We can talk marketing if that's what you want. Um, go to expertscale.com. So there's my community. I've got some courses and I'm doing events now. For example, the event that you'll be sponsoring. Thank you for that. So I've got, like, I would tell people, like, I got the stuff that makes you feel good. And I got the stuff that won't make you feel that great, but it'll protect the shit out of you. Um, I've got both sides. So expertscale.com or don't say that.com. Love it, man. That's awesome. Appreciate you carving out time. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Love it. I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I enjoyed doing it. I need your help. There are three places you can find Beyond a Million. The podcast itself beyondamillion.com, which has some cool free resources, including a free course. And we finally launched the Beyond a Million YouTube channel. I would love it if you would go there and subscribe. And if you don't want to, you still would probably enjoy seeing the visual content. Check it out, youtube.com forward slash at beyondamillion.com.